Alright, story mode of King of Fighters 13. This is the King of Fighters, the biggest fighting tournament in the world. Fighters from all over the world gather to compete, but trouble is always brewing behind the scenes, and those who are drawn here by fate are the center of this drama. Those from the distant land. Through the appearance of this mysterious and powerful clan, a wave of chaos has spread across the King of Fighters world. Mukai and Mak Makagi, these two appeared in previous tournaments, are conspiring to fully awaken Orochi. I couldn't read the rest. Their origin, their true desires, their abilities, nothing is known of this clan, but in order to fight them, an international police organization has requested Hydern's investigation team to take action. Under the leadership of Ralph and Clark, a team of agents that has successfully resolved several crises in the past since forth, but even during the course of two tournaments, they've been unable to make such headway in their investigations. While repelling the growing threat, Hydern was constantly searching to find an opening to retaliate. And then, in the midst of the situation with those from the distant land, a young boy suddenly appeared. He steered the mysterious clan and those who opposed it while attempting to meet his own mysterious ends. Ash Crimson. So Ash Crimson has been the main character of the past couple King of Fighters, huh? He was bound by his bloodline to fight those from distant land, but he's forsaken this mission. He parted from Elizabeth Land Torch, who shared his mission, and instead stole the powers of the sacred treasures from their owners. He stole the power of the Yada from Shizuru, obtained the power of the Yakazami here, the Yakasami from Yori, and all that remains is the sword of Kusanagi. The powers have come together and Orochi is about to awaken. As if the response this, the King of Fighter Tournament is once again going to be held. The name of the organizer is unknown. The fighters receive their invitations and are caught up in the media something something. The investigations are signed R. The tournament begins and the saga draws toward its conclusion. So this sounds like it's the third in a trilogy of stories. And this is what happens with all the King of Fighters games. They have a trilogy of games that, that flesh out a story. First it was the Orochi Saga. I think after that it was the Nest Saga. And now we have this one. Which is those from a distant land. The stone pillars discovered were, so were choked by ivy and the charred rocks were covered by a deep green moss. The once mighty tree had lost its limbs from the fire started growing again, and on its slim but lively branches, small birds chirped at each other. The beautiful mansion that graced this place has become nothing but rubble. Even the remains of that great fire have been swallowed up by nature. Elizabeth Blank Torch, a clad lead in garment and veil, looked up at what remained of a goddess statue. She remembered the day she spent with Ash ten years ago. Ever since the mansion was burned down, the Bland Torch retainers had kept Ash away from the remains. They claimed to be worried about him since he had no family, but even as a child, Ash also clearly felt they didn't want him to cause trouble. To the Bland Torches, Ash had been dragged into the family by Elizabeth was a nuisance. However, Ash had frequently visited this place with Elizabeth to walk around the premises. It was Elizabeth's task to help the important guests sneak out, doing reckless things like sliding down the mansion's walls and creating holes in the fence. <laughs> One day, when my mission's done, I'm going to rebuild my house here. Then I'll leave Betty's place and bring everyone back. Ash whispered, unclear whether he spoke to himself or he addressed her, as he knew on the ground with a stick he picked up, drew on the ground. Elizabeth looked around and answered to him. She felt she had to say something, fearing that Ash might disappear into the silence of the ruins. Just enough time to read these. I'd be lonely without without you around, Ash. Ash running around the burnt si site and drawing silly sketches of where his future stables and soccer field would be, turned around and smiled. Then why don't you live here with me, Betty? Before she could even react, Elizabeth's face turned bright red. She began asking Ash what he meant, trying her best to act unmoved, but then she noticed his mischievous smile. I guess Betty is short for Elizabeth. What do you think I mean, huh? Why, you little... Elizabeth stepped forward, swollen in anger, only to collide with Ash who ran toward her. Unable to withstand the impact, Elizabeth tumbled into the dry grass with Ash in her arms. Isn't she, like, an older woman? <laughs> That was over there. What she remembered ten years back was now covered with grass. Elizabeth accepted that everything in this world was imper imp impermanent, impermanent, and she still felt a slight pain deep inside her chest. Why did Ash change? Impermanent. What a word. I can do whatever I want. It's none of your concern, Betty. My mission? Oh yeah, I remember something like that. Huh, seems like Ash grew up and completely forgot about what he was dedicated to when he was young. He says, ha ha, well, whatever. you leave me alone? You're a pain. 
Ashley started hiding things from Elizabeth. She had no idea what though. Every time she asked, Ashley would avoid her and put distance between them. And then one day he just disappeared. She didn't know what Ash wanted. She didn't know what Ash was doing. She didn't know anything about Ash. It went on like this for the past 10 years. Elizabeth realized she was clenching her fists tightly. It's going to be dark soon, my lady. Elizabeth's old butler looked upon her with worry. The sun had gone under and the light was quickly disappearing behind the hills. She turned towards the butler and said, I can sense his presence. She unclenched her fists. He's not here now, but he was definitely here. I'm certain of it. My lady, don't worry, Jacques. Jacques de Coq. Jacques had been in the Blanche Torture Service ever since before Elizabeth's burst. Through experience, he became quite skilled at reading her feelings. Elizabeth gave the worried butler a determined look and continued. I haven't lost my courage. I'm just preparing myself. What the fuck? Is that so? If he really has forsaken his own mission, then I shall need to be prepared to deal with that outcome. But my lady, that's too... I'll be fine. She looked at her unclenched fists and saw several small white orbs of light. The light inside of Elizabeth, pure and vivid, faintly illuminated her face. As long as there is light in my heart. What the fuck? Is there any gameplay or is this just a story to read? I thought there was going to be gameplay here. What the fuck? I guess not. Maxima, this is odd. Okay, you mean me being here? Maxima, don't be like that, buddy. Investigating ruins may not be our style, but remember, we're just doing this for the money. Maxima ran his eyes along the corridor of the ruins. It was a small movement, but his body sensors were set to full, and they could gather vast amounts of data as a result of that slight adjustment. Next to him was K, or K-Dash. His sunglasses did absolutely nothing to mask the utter boredom etched into his face. The desert ruins were located in southern Saudi Arabia. This stone structure had suddenly appeared in this desolate area. Maxima and K-Dash had come here to investigate. I hate this place, it's too hot. Well, it's because you like ice. The young girl loudly complained from behind K-Dash, leaning against a wall, and left Maxima momentarily lost as to how he should proceed. Being the leader isn't easy. So Maxima's the leader of this team, huh? He says, well, then complain to Mother Earth, won't you? Grumbling, Maxima continued gathering data. By studying the weathering and the rate of decay of the radioactive elements, the software reported an estimated year of construction. It was at least a thousand years old, possibly older. He tagged the report important and sent it to the other two wirelessly, but Kate Ash had a different opinion. <laughs> Kate Ash, so what? Maxima, this could be a huge discovery. The three talked as they advanced down the straight corridor. The corridor ended in an area almost entirely shrouded from the sun's rays. The surrounding walls were covered in a weathered relief, and the wall at the end had been destroyed by someone. Kula, check this out. What Kula pointed to was a relief containing bizarre images. It was a portrayal of inhuman shapes with tremendous powers. Some that controlled space, others that tapped into the vast energy of the Earth, surrounded by people in various places. Kula, I don't like this. Very few people depicted around the shapes were standing. The images were crude, but they were clearly kneeling prone or hurling through the air. They were all, all, almost likely dead. Kula and Maxima were taken aback by the eeriness of the relief. The lives beyond must not be meddled with by man. Kate Ash, however, scoffed at it and said, Yes? Looks like they're fighting to me. His words broke the other two out of their trance. They looked away from the relief of the three of them peered through the wall. Judging by the data gathered from their investigation, the final room would be just inside. It's too dark to see anything in here. It's alright, my calculations indicate the sunlight should enter soon. It shouldn't take long now. Sorry, about time. A tombstone looks like a door. The back walls got the shapes of people again. Maybe those were gods that were worshipped. The line drawn between them could mean... The distance, severed ties, different beings. 
Far away, long ago, the past. Nah, no, can't be. Come on, let's go. This place is creeping me out. Alright, I've collected the spatial data for this place and the surrounding terrain. I can report it by satellite once we're outside. Let's get out of here. Yeah.